can help encourage them in their faith journey. Okay. Now, a pastor is a very similar role. It's not two separate, always two separate people. Okay. But a pastor also um, kind of guides the life of the church. Is one of the people that guides the life of the church and and watches over people and things like that. So it's a, it's kind of they're very interrelated. It's like saying someone is a teacher and a lecturer. Okay, you don't know that term yet. We're not going to go there. <laughs> okay. Okay. A teacher and a speaker. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So, but as to why they teach different things. When so I think one of you asked a question about why there are different kinds of questions. Churches. I don't remember who asked that. Was that you? Okay. So um, when we read a piece of scripture, um, there are sometimes many different ways to interpret it. So for, um, interpret is a word for how do we understand it, okay? Like, um, like uh, let's see, what, do you know, that, is there a movie you both have watched? Have you talked about that yet? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so, so let's say, let's say there's a movie you've both watched. Let's say one of the Transformer movies, right? You're familiar with those, right? Uh, Bumblebee. Bumblebee, okay. Oh, that's an excellent question. So let, uh, let's say that you've both watched the same Transformer movie, and one of you thinks Bumblebee is the best Transformer, and the other one thinks, no, Bumblebee doesn't do a good job at all. Okay, but it's the same movie, but two people are looking at it in two different ways. Okay. Um, and then you can sometimes get into an argument. <laughs> but with scripture, it's, we read the same scripture, but sometimes there are two, when two different people look at it, they look at it in two different ways. And so sometimes a lot of the differences between different kinds of churches have to do with how do we live out all of those beliefs and understandings about the Bible. So if that helped your wondering at all, Well, I am so glad that you come and you wonder, because I encourage adults to wonder too. Um, the more we wonder about our faith, is the more opportunities we have to understand it more fully and, and be um, go a little bit deeper. So I'm so glad that you're willing to come forward and wonder with me. So I don't know if there's a lesson after, is there a lesson today? Yep, okay. So I believe Mr. D Mr. Don is leading the lesson today. Okay. So you're gonna have here you go. You're gonna have a different leader today in your lesson. So have a wonderful time. I'll see you later at Hot Cocoa and Cookies. Thank you for wondering. Oops. Oh, are they gonna listen to the scripture? Okay. Oops. Okay, we have uh, two scripture passages this day. Um, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. And they are both part of the lectionary readings for this day. And uh, the lectionary was a, a designed to, I just thought that um, I will rarely do this. I will rarely put two scripture passages in conversation with each other. Um, but I felt that today they uh, would help illuminate each other. So the passage from the Old Testament is from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And this is a section of scripture that some people have, have heard before. And here is the passage from Micah. Let us listen to these words God has for us this day and has had for the people of God for thousands of years. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? A few centuries later, one of the early leaders of the church, Paul, wrote a letter to the church in Corinth in Greece. And this passage is from the letter Paul wrote that we know is first, the first letter of the Corinthians, and it's from the first chapter, verses 18 through 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, The world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ crucified the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. These are all words of God for the people of God in all times and in all places. Let us pray. Most holy God, we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to be in our hearts and in our minds, so that the words of my mouth and the prayers and meditations of all of us, wherever we are, be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, Paul talks an awful lot about foolishness in this letter to the Corinthians. It's not just in the first chapter. It's like a running theme throughout the letter. Um, And You see, it's really interesting because Paul knew an awful lot about foolishness. Before Paul became an early leader in the Christian church, he thought he had everything figured out. He was well-educated. He had a job for life. And he was quite fanatical and enthusiastic about enforcing the law of his faith, the Jewish faith. Now, you see, Paul got the law part right of the faith, but he missed the heart part completely. Which is really odd because when you think about it, Paul would have known all about this passage from the prophet Micah that we heard from today. He would have studied the scriptures and he would have discussed them endlessly with his colleagues. He would have known all the background of the passage We heard today from Micah, and he would have known the history behind it. You see, the I in the passage from Micah represents the people of Israel talking to the prophet. The people had, let's face it, really screwed up their relationship with God. 
and they were trying to figure out the best way to say a collective I'm sorry to God. So they wondered, with what should we come before the Lord? What should we offer? What should we sacrifice? Will it be happy if we give the Lord thousands and thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Should we give our firstborn for the sins of our souls? Now, this is a pretty wild passage, and you kind of have to laugh when you think about it, because really, thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil, what kind of sacrifice would it take their wondering to get everything right with God? They figured... If sacrificing one ram according to the law worked as a way to say, I'm sorry to God, would not a few thousand really take care of it once and for all? And if a cup or two of oil mixed with grain and uh, poured on the altar as what the law required as a sacrifice, would not it be so much better if it was tens of thousands of rivers of oil? would not not work tens of thousands of times better. You see, the Israelites knew the words of the law in their heads, but they missed the idea behind the word in their hearts. God did not want the firstborn child to be sacrificed, but the firstborn to be dedicated to God. God did not want gallons and gallons of oil poured on the altar, but wanted the heart of the believer to be laid there. God did not expect thousands and thousands of sheep, but the hands of the repentant raised in prayer. Now Micah responds with something that's simple, but very challenging. Michael tells, Micah tells the Israelites, God has told you what is good, and what does God require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Foolishness takes many forms in our world. We often don't think of it in connection with our faith. We think of all those times when we have felt foolish. Now, is there anybody here who's felt foolish at one time or another? <laughs> it usually happens when we choose to do something that we kind of have an inkling. Um, it's probably not all that great of an idea, but we go ahead anyway, and then the result gets kind of thrown in our face. We all know what we're talking about, right? It's a form of, of, of embarrassment. Like, for example... Um, the, not too long ago, there was a forecast, I know that this is odd to sound, but there was a forecast of snow for the weekend, um, not here. <laughs> um, and there was an event a weekend away. And uh, someone's packing list, I will admit, truly not mine, did not include, this is in New England, did not include boots, did not include a hat, did not include mittens, and no ice scraper. Now, the snowstorm came, and their feet got wet, and their hands got cold, and you know, so forth and so on. They're trying to push the snow off their car with their hands, and that's plain old human foolishness. It's lacking good sense. You know that you should have done better or something differently, and you feel foolish as a result. It's a whole lot of embarrassment. Nobody likes to feel foolish. But becoming a fool for Christ, which is what Paul is writing about to the Corinthians in, throughout this letter, is to become foolish by the world's standards, according to the world's wisdom. Becoming a fool for Christ means intentionally choosing to behave in unexpected ways, challenging society's norms, rejecting worldly wisdom about how to act in the world, Becoming a fool for Christ means choosing to do justice, choosing to love kindness, choosing to walk humbly with God. Stephen Colbert, who is a late-night talk show host and comedian, um, is active in the Catholic faith and spoke in an interview about his faith and about being a fool for Christ. 
Um, Stephen, he defined foolishness for Christ as the willingness to be wrong in society or wrong according to our time, but right according to our conscience as guided by the Holy Spirit. The most foolish thing of all about Christianity is the symbol of our faith. Someone once asked me, why is a Roman torture device the symbol of Christianity? Think about it. Punishment of death on the cross was for the lowest of the low in the criminal justice system of the Roman rulers. It represents severe pain, public humiliation, and a warning to all who witnessed it. Do not threaten Roman law and Roman government. One would have to be a complete and utter fool to think that a cross could become a symbol of hope, that a cross could become a symbol of God's love, that a cross could be the means through which God would save the world and everyone in it. Paul knew this foolishness of Christ firsthand. One day, when his name was still Saul, he was on a road trip to the city of Damascus, all eager to persecute people who had become followers of some man from Nazareth who had died on the cross. And on this road to the town of Damascus, Paul met up with the risen Lord. Paul, to very loosely translate, was hit with a holy two-by-four, and he was never the same afterwards. So much so that his name before that day was changed from Saul to Paul. And instead of persecuting those following Jesus, he became one of their leaders. If you want to know more about this particular part of Paul's story, check out chapter 9 in the book of Acts. Paul is an unlikely disciple of Christ if there ever was one. Paul became a fool for Christ. Unlikely disciples abound in the world. Hody Childress grew up poor, his family surviving in Alabama what they could farm themselves and by hunting small game. He grew up in a house that had no electricity until he was seven years old. When he became an adult, he joined the Air Force, later working for aerospace company Lockheed Martin for 20 years, and in his spare time, he worked the land at his hometown of Geraldine, Alabama, with a population of about 1,000. He knew people in his community, and they knew him. One day, a little over 10 years ago, in 2010, Hody walked into the pharmacy in Geraldine and spoke to Dr. Walker, the pharmacist. He said, do you have anyone who can't pay for their medication? And she said, yeah, that actually happens quite a lot. And he reached into his pocket and took out a folded up $100 bill and gave it to Dr. Walker and said, the next time it happens, I want you to use this. I want it to be anonymous. I don't want to know any details about who you use it on or why. Just tell them this is a blessing from the Lord. He came back a month later with another folded $100 bill and gave it to the pharmacist. He continued this practice on the first day of every month for all of those years until late last year when he became too ill to leave his home. Over the years, the pharmacist said the fund helped at least two people a month who either didn't have insurance or their benefits wouldn't cover the cost of medication. Now, Hody wasn't rich. He lived off a small retirement account and Social Security. But he never hesitated to help those in need. Hody was a fool for Christ. One of the people he helped was Eli, a young man of 15 years old who was allergic to bee strings. And um, his parents told him, excuse me, his doctor told his parents in no uncertain words, you have to get an EpiPen and keep it with you at all times. 
but the cost is prohibitive. A single dose with insurance was going to cost the family about $800. Dr. Walker, the pharmacist, found a coupon to knock some of the cost off, but Eli's mother was concerned. She said, I just started squalling. She was a secretary for the principal at the high school. She said, we're a two-income family, but still the $300 cost was a lot of money. So to help the family, Dr. Walker turned to the envelope she kept full of carefully folded $100 bills from Hody. When Dr. Walker told Eli's mother that money from an anonymous donor would cover the cost of the EpiPen, she cried with relief. Dr. Walker told me it's taken care of, no questions asked, and I asked how, but she would never tell me. Hody Childress died less than a month ago on January 1st. No one knew about his monthly donations to the pharmacy medication fund, not even his wife. Only when he became too ill to go himself did he confide his secret to one other person, his daughter. It was just who he was, she said. It was in his heart. But she decided to reveal the story of generosity at his funeral, and things came full circle. You see, Eli's family discovered who had been their benefactor for Eli's EpiPen. And Eli worked on a poultry farm that Hody had started that was now run by his son, Douglas. Eli's mother said all of a sudden it came out that Mr. Hody did it. What he doesn't know now that he's in heaven is that he helped a kid who worked on a farm that he started. His daughter, Tanya, said, I think he felt like he could not give. Giving that way just got in his heart, and he felt like he needed to do it. If what he did could touch one person and let them know there's still goodness in the world, it's worth it. It's what my dad would have wanted. Other fools for Christ have started to emerge. Since newspapers wrote up the story, Hody's family and Dr. Walker, the pharmacist, have received calls and messages from people across the United States wanting to donate to the fund at the pharmacy in Geraldine. A couple of weeks ago, a person called from Miami. He told the pharmacist that unless she needed the money in Geraldine, he was going to approach his local pharmacy and start his own Hody Childress account. following a crucified Jesus who died on a cross is so very foolish according to the wisdom of the world. And yet, making that choice to follow Jesus is the very thing that will change the world into a just, kind, and God-centered community. Our foolishness in following Christ makes us part of God's plan of salvation for the world. We are all unlikely disciples of Christ. As Paul wrote and Micah proclaimed, consider your own call, my brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen and hallelujah. Cheers.
calls us, God's great reign of love extends. We proclaim what we've been given. Jesus came to set us free. We are called to love and serve him. There is joy in ministry. There is joy. Now we have the, uh, the blessing of asking for uh, God's blessing to be um, placed upon all those who have agreed to serve in leadership positions in the coming year. And so um, I'm going to ask everyone who is in an elected position of leadership um, to come forward. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> If those of you who are elected positions are watching at home, I'm going to ask you to stand too. You can stand on either side. Mm. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. All right, so uh, there are a total of 24 people who have agreed to serve in elected committees in the coming year. Uh, this is all only a small portion of those who have agreed to a variety of leadership positions, both elected and unelected in the ministries of this church. But the administration of the church is indeed a ministry. Can y'all hear me okay? Um, and so I just want to ask um, for, we want to ask for God's blessing upon them. So there's room for participation here for everyone. So um, I'm going to address those who are uh, standing before you now and those of you at home who are standing at home. You have been called by God and chosen by the people of God for leadership in the church. This ministry is a blessing and a serious responsibility. In love, we thank you for accepting your obligation and challenge you to offer your best to the Lord, to this people, and to our ministry in this world. Live a life in Christ and make him known in your witness and in your work. Do you this day acknowledge yourself a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? I do. Will you devote yourself to the service of God in the world? I will. Will you so live that you enable this church to be a people of love and peace? Will you do all in your power to be responsible to the task for which you have been chosen? I will. Almighty God, pour out your blessing upon these your servants who have been given particular ministries in your church. 
grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly to your service. Guide them in their work, reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now to all who are present, my friends rejoice that God provides laborers in the field and for the vineyards. Will you do all you can to assist and encourage them in the responsibilities to which they have been called? giving them your cooperation, your counsel, and your prayers. We will. Let us affirm them and the ministries to which they have agreed to serve. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for saying yes. <laughs> Each time that we gather, we have the opportunity and the privilege of uh, sharing with each other the joys and concerns um, for our lives and for the lives of our beloveds and our communities. Um, uh, so we have a number that have uh, reached us um, through the news in the coming in the previous week and um, through other means and also through your presence here today. Um, I just found out we're not currently live. Is that correct? Okay, so if any of you who are watching later um, would like to share a prayer concern, um, uh, please just um, give the office, church office a call or uh, send um, me an email or Donna um, an email, um, and we will make sure it gets included in the coming week. So we want to ask for prayers for all those affected by the tornado in the Houston, Texas area, for not just one, but the two shootings in California, for the attack at a synagogue in Jerusalem, for God's healing and presence to be made known, known in the lives of uh, Carrie Ann of the congregation, um, for Dwight, the brother-in-law of Donna P., um, who's recovering from knee replacement, for Diane G. of this congregation who now lives in Rhode Island, um, she is facing upcoming brain surgery um, at the end of February. Um, uh, for uh, Connie C., healing and strength. For Liz of this congregation, um, she recently underwent a knee replacement. Things are going well so far, but continued healing. Uh, for Candy, formerly of this congregation, um, who is um, undergoing treatment for COVID. For Aaron of this congregation, for the possibility and hope um, of new treatment options. Um, for Elizabeth, um, Abigail's mother, um, who is having trouble walking. She's normally with us in the sanctuary. Um, for Lorraine's son-in-law, Darren, with uh, health issues. Prayers also for a woman named Joan who is looking for an apartment. Um, prayers for the family and children of Karen, uh, not of this congregation, who passed away recently. Um, prayers for the family and friends of uh, Jill Bidstrup um, um, of this congregation who passed away a couple of weeks ago. Is there anything else that people would like to add? We can't. No. Okay, uh, Sherry? Okay. So Edwin, um, who passed away at the age of 23. Medical tests. For Kate, um, with upcoming medical tests. Okay, anything else? Oh, 
picture. Okay. Continued recovery for a Billy. I'll offer a prayer on behalf of all that has been mentioned, and then we will offer together the Lord's Prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious Lord, the symbol of the cross is both shocking and awesome, horrifying and encouraging. But we see in it, Lord, your love and through that love comes your grace and your mercy comes hope and comes peace that surpasses our understanding and we know we can approach you confidently in this prayer and know that you will hear us so we ask of you for your healing and your peace to be in the community of Houston as they suffer the effects of the tornado, to be in the communities in California suffering from the loss of life due to gun violence, to be in the city of Jerusalem as they suffer the violence at an attack at a house of worship. We ask that your healing spirit work in and through those to whom you have given the heal gift of healing who are entrusted with the care of the beloveds we raise up before you now. For Carrie Ann, for Dwight, for Diane, for Connie, for Liz, for Candy, for Aaron, for Elizabeth, for Darren, for Kate, for Billy. We ask that your guiding spirit of hope be with Joan as she looks for a new place to live. May that place fulfill her needs and may it be a place that she flourishes. We ask that your comfort be in the household of those who have lost beloveds as they grieve the loss of Karen, of Jill, and of Edwin. Assure these households of family and friends, Lord, that uh, you are present and that you will never leave them. Have them share memories, have them share joy, have them share grief with each other and with you. And in all these ways, Lord, we ask that you hear our hearts. We ask that you hear of our desire to be fools in your name, to guide us and then to encourage us in those ways. Have us always, Lord, wherever we find ourselves on our journey, to entrust in you. And always, if we have no words, to entrust in the prayer that you taught us, that we offer together now to your Father, and our Father, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My sisters and brothers, I thank you for your faithfulness and presence and prayers and gifts and service and in witness. I thank you for your faithfulness and stewardship through what you have given today, through what you have put through the front mail slot, through what you have sent to the United States Postal Service, and through what you have given electronically. We have placed these on the altar, and we will ask for God's blessing upon them. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Ever present and holy God, we offer these gifts in the hope that they will bring justice to those in need. 
We consecrate these gifts with the prayer that they will help others learn to love kindness and to walk in humility. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing as him and as prayer. I'm going to live so God can use me. My sisters and brothers, as you strive to walk the way of justice and peace, may the blessing of God, creator, healer, and giver of life, bless you and keep you always. And let us say hallelujah and amen. Hallelujah and amen.